Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. And joining us in studio as a special guest host, the host of The Rachel Maddow Show and best-selling author whose new book is called Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism, Rachel Maddow. Welcome Hi, back. Hi, guys. It's nice to see you. Great to see you. It's last a- time I was here, I was on crutches, John remembered. Yeah. 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 That it- was my last book tour. I did the whole thing on crutches. Oof. Right. It was That's October of 2019. Before it before all began. It all, yeah, before everything got interesting. Yeah. Um, all right, we're going to talk about your book a bit later. We're also going to talk about President Biden's growing number of political challenges and Donald Trump's growing number of legal challenges. Uh, but first, we are now on week three of House Republicans' failure to agree on which of them should be speaker. Uh, a clown show that has paralyzed the government just a few weeks before it runs out of money. And just a few days after President Biden asked Congress to pass $100 billion in additional funding to defend Ukraine against Putin, Israel against Hamas, Taiwan against China, and beef up security along our southern border. Uh, so since Jim Jordan went down in flames last week, eight House Republicans have declared their candidacy for speaker. Actually, nine did, but we we lost one tonight. So what, do you, what do you mean? We, we, like, we he, lost he one him. tragically? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just, we, we turned up. We thought, I thought he'd been in my pocket. Some guy, his name is from Pennsylvania. Dan uh, Muser. There you go, Tommy. Muser? Muser? Uh, Mazer? He went Muser. down. Yeah. Uh, anyway, none of these people are well known to anyone outside their districts who isn't a political <laughs> junkie, uh, including the leading contender, Majority Whip Tom Emmer of Minnesota, whose face I couldn't pick out of a lineup if my life depended on it. Um, All I know is that there was rumored to be some bad blood between Donald Trump and Emmer after he voted to certify the 2020 election, Mm. Uh, though here's what Trump said when he was asked about Emmer on Monday. Well, he is my biggest fan now because he called me yesterday and he told me I'm your biggest fan, so I don't know about that. I said, there's only one person that can do it all the way. You know who that is? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus came down and said, I want to be speaker. He would do it. <laughs> the funny thing about that is uh, Tom Emmer <laughs> tweeted that clip of uh, Trump's non-endorsement of Tom Emmer and said, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you for putting my name in your mouth, You're even right. that way. In, in, in a way that was not too mean. Um, Rachel, at some point, the uh, so do you think there's any reason to believe that the internal dynamics that have Republicans without a speaker will change with any of these candidates? And can you name more than two of the candidates? <laughs> <laughs> more than two of the eight? Of the eight. Well, Tom Emmer, thank you. There you go. Okay, yeah. you got one. Pete, Se- Pete Sessions. Oh, yes. there you Pete go. Sessions is actually a recognizable yes, figure from previous much. eras of Republican scandal. That's right. Yes, because there was a time where you had to learn that it was a different Sessions right. than, than Jefferson than Jeff Beauregard. Sessions. Yes. yes. Uh, so Jeff Sessions. You passed. You got it. You got two. I did. It yeah. was more than two. It was more than two. Oh, shit, you're right. It was the one that you and I both half named. I was the Pennsylvania Maze M- or something Mu- like that. Is it Musar or Mazer? M e u s e r. He was uh, Home Care Magazine's Home Caring Award recipient in 2006. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you guys one more, and that's all I know is Byron Donalds. Mm-hmm. Byron oh Donalds. yeah, yeah. Uh, other than that, I don't have. He I don't have any of the rest. Appears on the Fox. That's right. Yeah, yes. yeah that's how I know him because he's on the TV. Mike Johnson is that something? Jack Johnson. Bergman. Anyway, John had another question. Yeah, sorry. My serious question. Any any reason to believe that these internal dynamics change this week? No, or next I mean week? there's nothing in there's nothing unless there's some great reveal about an incredible set of leadership qualities among <laughs> one of these candidates who we can't name, who we couldn't pick out of a lineup, who we probably couldn't name even if we had their names in front of us. Like you know, I'm not sure we would get their names pronounced correctly. No. Uh, I don't think there's I don't, I don't think it's a personality a personality or a personnel problem that the Republicans have. I think the problem that they have is that there's no good job in government in a party that doesn't want government. Mm. So there's being like the highest ranking job you can get is still the worst job ever because anybody with a job in government is obviously suspect. And so I think being anti-institutionalist when it comes to the federal government just means there's not, I mean, they'll have to, I guess they'll finally have to figure something out about how to get somebody in there. But I also feel like I don't know how much any of them fear any of the things that we think rationally would put pressure on them. Yeah. Oh, the government will shut down. Well, that's the reason they fired McCarthy is because he stopped that from happening. Yeah. We won't be able to fund our allies. Oh, that bet that's going to keep them up at night. Right. 
I yeah, just I, don't I know. feel like they've been hoisted by their um, own anti-majoritarian petard. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like now that a couple people it can stop someone from being speaker, then it, every incentive is for the most extreme members of the caucus to continue doing that. Because as you pointed out, most of them don't care about all those things you mentioned. Certainly, Matt Gates. And the eight people or seven or eight people who uh, tried to or, or successfully ousted McCarthy don't give a shit about any of that. I think I mean, for me, I see this as sort of it's the it's the Venn diagram of um, hilarious and scary, which has been a lot of our lives yeah. in politics for these past seven or eight years. But it is funny that they can't just among themselves come up with somebody to be the next person they fire. You know, even if it's just for a month, what like it is, yeah. it's ridiculous. And at the same time, I just keep thinking about all of the legislators around the world that used to be a real thing that became rubber stamps or that got watered down or became Potemkin legislatures when we changed when those when those governments changed from democratic forms of government into strongman forms of government. I mean, one of the things that happens is that every other form of governmental authority has to wither or be refashioned so that it is in service of the strongman in order for the strongman to lead um, an authoritarian government. And obviously, you know, I, I, I don't know if you polled Republicans in public office as to whether or not they want that, but by hook or by crook, that's the project they're part of right now. And I don't know that they want to fix it. Yeah. No, it doesn't seem like that. And I mean, the only thing I can think about is the government's going to shut down in a couple of weeks and there's at least, you know, 12 members, Republican House members who are sitting in districts that Joe Biden won. Mm -hmm. And if this chaos is paired with a government shutdown and mm -hmm. they start hearing from people at home that there's a government shutdown because these clowns couldn't get their act together and elect a speaker. And so therefore it's actually hurting people that maybe those Republicans in the Biden districts either say we're going to reach out to Democrats mm -hmm. um, to try to get something done or they're going to cave and say, all right, we'll let one of the crazy right wingers become speaker. Yeah, um, they seem equally likely and yes. equal, equally yeah. unlikely. The Democrats have done a good job and Hakeem Jeffries has done a good job at making sure that Democratic fingerprints are off this mess. The Republicans, I think, were counting on a government shutdown, and maybe they're counting on this legislative shutdown now as somehow being blamed by the average man on the street on the Democrats because Joe Biden is president. And so therefore, anytime something goes wrong in government and there is a president of the Democratic Party, you can blame that president, you can blame his party, even if you yourself caused the problem. In this case, I think Hakeem Jeffries, even for people who aren't paying very close attention has created an environment in which it is obvious that this is the Republicans own problem and not Democrats. Yeah. So that maybe creates more of a path for them to come up with some power sharing agreement. Tommy, um, Joe Biden hasn't said too much about this mess. Mm -hmm. uh, understandably, he's got a few other things on his plate. Do you think it's worth him getting involved in a bigger way if this keeps going? Or is this a uh, not my circus, not my monkey sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think political polarization is such that anything he does or says will probably have the opposite impact within the Republican Party. It will not be perceived as helpful or it will be twisted to be unhelpful in some way. So, I mean, Trump keeps jumping in and endorsing people. That hasn't seemed to help. <laughs> he's, he's their dear leader. And like, yeah, I like you know what you were saying earlier, sort of the Victor Orbanization of, of government, right, where you just sort of the state withers around it, whether it's the judiciary, uh, attacks on the freedom of the press. Ironically, though, the legislature did this version of it to themselves. Mm -hmm. right? Matt Gates came forward with a motion to vacate and made it so any one member can take down the speaker. And now the entire institution seems to be withering on the vine and unable to fix itself. But I don't know. Joe but Biden getting in would seem to me, uh, I don't know that he's got a lot of SWAT here. I, I worry, though, that it is the MAGA wing of the Republic. I mean, is there another wing? It's the maga east mm. um, <laughs> members of the party who did this to the Congress. Sure. And that seems to me very worrying. I mean, it was... You know, when, when it was the, the Duma withering in Moscow, right, it was United Russia that was helping that to its end. And I, I, I just think that the, the, the party that has is part of a strongman authoritarian takeover project um, will see individual members of that party do themselves out of jobs to serve the larger purpose of installing their leader. Mm. And so that's just, I mean, again, that's like the doomsday look at it, but I don't know how this ends. Well, yeah, and I think, I don't think Biden um, would 
uh, help anything by getting involved right now. I do think if we get close, because I also think that for most of the country, this is like inside baseball and they don't know what's going on right now. Mm. Um, I think most of them hate Washington and they see dysfunction in Washington and they don't like it and they don't really know who to point their finger at, Right, unfortunately. So I think as we head towards a government shutdown, then I, I think that Biden could go out there and say... The, just what I was saying earlier, which is like these clowns can't get their act together. Mm -hmm. And because of their own petty grievances, their own ambition, um, people are going to be put out of work. People aren't going to get government benefits that they are. there's going to be women and children who don't have food assistance. There's going to be air travel delays. And it's all because these assholes couldn't figure out how to elect a speaker. And I think that's probably a useful message as we get towards November. So but right how, now does, I would. how does he make sure that that lesson is sort of heard in those terms rather than what you're saying, Tommy, in terms of people hate Washington, they blame Washington, they don't dis they don't differentiate between who it is. I mean, I, I was sort of arguing that the Democrats have done a pretty good job keeping Democratic fingerprints off this problem yeah. and making it a pure Republican problem. But it sounds like you think that people are going to blame everybody, even if only one side is I just, There's a Pew survey that went around recently which showed like the average voter just hates Washington. It has no, the approval of the institution of Congress is like 6%. It was really terrible. And yeah. Yeah. We've also, I mean, we've seen, we've been through a round of this. And even if poll after poll shows that we've made this argument well, and most people don't blame Joe Biden, and most people hold Republicans accountable, it still goes on the ledger of America, kind of a mess, uncertain, the mm -hmm. kind of sour mood that contributes to uh, Joe Biden's low approval ratings, concerns about the economy, a world that is in crisis, that whether or not any, in any individual issue, Joe Biden may have support or may have uh, less weakness. On the whole, people having a sense that the country is moving in a wrong direction mm -hmm. does, is false, to, becomes blame for him. I think you could keep Democratic hands off the problem by having Joe Biden go out there and say, um, look, this is, uh, we had a deal. I had a deal with Kevin McCarthy, a bipartisan spending deal mm -hmm. that we both agreed to. We both compromised a little bit. He went back on his word. Then they fired him. Then there was complete chaos. We are very willing to work with Republicans on a bipartisan deal, on a bipartisan spending deal. I got Mitch McConnell over here in the Senate. He's willing to do it. Some Republican senators seem to do it. But this MAGA extreme wing of the House can't even get they can't even agree among themselves on a speaker, and everyone's hurting because of it because the government's going to shut down. And I think that keeps him as the like bipartisan deal maker, but still lays the blame on Republicans. And probably he'll get the chance to have a bigger audience for this as we get closer to the shutdown. Yeah, I mean, there's another Venn diagram, which is the Venn diagram that Republicans have to smash together to get to the 217 votes that they need. Right? That has to be an overlap of 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 the people who want to govern or just want this problem off their plate and the people who love this fight and love this mass right got to smash those people together and to get to 217 they couldn't do that with jim jordan even under incredible amounts of pressure there were still uh you know two dozen roughly people that were willing even in the face of all that pressure to say no i think that that's like a heartening sign mm -hmm. but it is a worry it is really worrying that yeah we don't know which way this is going to go but if you were looking back on the last six or seven years and said hey what are you going to bet on are you going to bet on squishy republicans are going to be brave or going to be cowards <laughs> when being cowards means going along with whoever the last person is in front of their podium before the government closes or does something kind of uh slightly daring and they decide to go be legends and <laughs> and come over and figure out some kind of a deal like ugh, it's a scary thing to bet on to bet on bravery with these people. Yeah. And yeah. I think, in general, I think in politics, trick plays do not work. Mm. Anything that, you know, like a discharge mm -hmm. petition never works. Like the, the and the, you know, the January 6th shenanigans. Like, even if you subtract all the violence from that, like, I know, we'll pretend there's secret other electors. And then Vice President Pence will be shocked and won't know what to do. And then it'll end up in the House of... Like, all of these stupid trick plays that somebody in, as a 1L in law school could invent as a way through the Constitution. Like, it just never works. Yeah. Yeah. The straight up stuff is always the way it ends up getting I hammered will, out. Yes, we, we didn't mint the coin. Uh, but, <laughs> but I will say... Coin. Someday you know, we will. Impeachment one, eagle. There are huh? exceptions. Or the impeachment <laughs> eagle. Uh, there isn't... It's like Obamacare, you know, Ted Kennedy dies, we lose the supermajority in the Senate. And yeah. they did come up with a trick play, which is like, wait, if we pass the House bill, even though it's got lots of typos, which we'll be dealing with for a decade, we can do reconciliation and we can find a way through it once in a long while. Yes. Once in a long, long while... Well, with, with, legislation. With, with legislation, with legislation, it can happen every once in a while. It can happen. Today's presenting sponsor is Simply Safe Home Security. Tommy, what's your Halloween thing? Do you uh, save your candy or did you eat it all at once? 
when you mm, were a kid? I think I kept it in like a stash and I saved it and ate it slowly over the course of, let's be honest, days, if not a Yeah, week. I was going to say the first two days, I think I probably ate like five or six pieces of candy at once. If you're looking to save this fall, right now you can get 40% off any new Simply Safe system. It was named the best home security system of 2023 by U.S. News and World Report. I don't quite know what the uh, connection with the Halloween candy to the uh, to the rest of the Simply Safe ad was in this one. Someone stealing your candy? All right, let's do it that way. Don't let anyone steal your candy. Use Simply Safe, like John Lovett. He set it up himself. He's been using it for years, and it's protected him because it's fantastic technology. It's powered by 24/7 professional monitoring for less than a dollar a day, half the cost of traditional home security. With new 24-7 live guard protection and smart alarm wireless indoor camera, monitoring agents can see and speak to intruders, helping stop crime in real time. A powerful technology exclusively from Simply Safe. Satisfaction is backed by Simply Safe's money back guarantee. You can try it for 60 days risk free. If you don't love it, return your system for a full refund. For a limited time, save 20% on any new system with a fast protect plan. Visit simplysafe.com slash crooked. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Right now, I'd like to give a shout out to all those people whose job it is to hire, from the small business owners growing their team to the HR directors hiring hundreds across the nation. You have one of the toughest jobs there is. We know that. You know, we've been through it ourselves. Damn right. But what if I were to tell you all that there's something that can make your whole hiring process faster and easier? It is, of course, ZipRecruiter. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. Instead of you doing all the hiring work, ZipRecruiter works for you. Once you post your job on ZipRecruiter, it sends it to 100-plus job sites so you can reach more of the right people. ZipRecruiter's powerful technology scans thousands of resumes for you to identify people whose skills and experience match your job. Hiring heroes. Let ZipRecruiter make your job easier. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Pod Save America is brought to you by Outer Known. Is your closet fall ready? Yes. Well, we're in it. We're we're into fall, so I hope so. Too late if it's not. I actually bought a uh, Outer Known shirt the other day. Really? Was mm-hmm. it a t-shirt? Was it a hoodie? It is called the Transitional Flannel Utility Shirt. <laughs> wow, okay. Navy Jasp Medium. I got to get some modern and clothes. 35 bucks off with uh, my code. Oh, that's amazing. They got comfortable clothes that I've known. They're very stylish. Every product has a planet first mentality. That means that the uh, materials are all environmentally friendly and the factories they work with provide safe working conditions and fair living wages for all workers. All of their clothes are comfortable, breathable. They fit great. They're sustainably made from high-quality organic and recycled materials. Some of their best sellers are the Apex Trunks, which is the most high-performance trunk out there. Lightweight, durable, and perfect for adventure. they got jumpsuits that are popular. High-quality t-shirts for every occasion. We love Outer Known here. We've been buying their clothes for a long time. Go to OuterKnown.com slash PSA25 today, and you'll get 25% off your first order. That's OuterKnown.com slash PSA25, spelled O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com slash PSA25 to receive the 25% off discount code. Check them out today, OuterKnown.com slash PSA25. Speaking of President Biden, uh, his political challenges keep piling up. His polling isn't great, but even if you don't believe all the polls, he is an incumbent president who's asking an extremely grumpy electorate to stick with him. And now his plan to spend another $100 billion supporting foreign wars, one of which is currently dividing the Democratic Party. Uh, The Washington Post also reported that over the weekend, Biden, quote, continues to express frustration in private conversations about the state of his polling in battleground states. Yeah, no shit. Uh, And on Friday, (laughs) Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips of Minnesota is expected to announce a primary challenge to the president in New Hampshire. Uh, I thought Dean Phillips gave it up. Oh, no. It's happening. Oh, my God. Apparently, all the reporting said like he hasn't made the final, final decision, but everything's <laughs> prepared. They're going to New Hampshire. There's going to be, yeah. It's they're a, printing the signs. They're printing the signs. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't want to let it leak out in advance because they don't want to take away from the excitement. <laughs> right. Gonna say, right. Again, Dean Phillips, if you showed me a picture of Tom Emmer and Dean Phillips, I would not be able to tell you who's who. But they're both from Minnesota. And maybe they'll kiss. <laughs> <laughs> kiss, um, kiss, kiss. Wow. So, let's start let's start with um uh Israel. Tommy, there have been quite a few stories about uh Arab American and Muslim mm-hmm. American leaders saying they will not vote for Joe Biden in twenty twenty four because of his support for Israel. Mm-hmm. How big of a problem do you think that is for the president? And is there anything he can do to fix it short of calling for a ceasefire or withholding aid to Israel, which he does not seem inclined to do at this point. I mean, I, I do think there's some real political risk here. I think that 
battleground states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, we won by some thin margins. I mean, Pen- uh, Michigan was like 150,000 votes, but Pennsylvania was pretty close. If a bunch of uh, Muslims or Arab American voters decide to stay home when in the past cycle they voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden, I think that could really matter. I also think a lot of people are, are talking about this like this is the first time that these communities have voiced frustration with Biden's Gaza policy. That mm-hmm. is not true. There were protests in 2021 mm-hmm. uh, during a previous bombing campaign to Gaza. And so I think the first thing Biden should do is um, more outreach, I think, to some of these communities. Like, he's incredibly empathetic. He did this meeting with uh, the families of victims who were killed or taken hostage in Israel. Something similar would be good for folks with family in Gaza. Um, I also think there's a real risk of losing young voters uh, for along similar lines, like people who are just less supportive of the war effort in polls or less supportive of arming Israel. You know, the supplemental generally, like $106 billion to foreign countries is not going to be very popular, I don't think. You know, we've all watched the polling on Ukraine support tick down over time. So I think there's a lot of risk here politically from much different angles. Was there any um, parallel situation like this in the Obama administration in terms of Obama worrying about the same types of support in the same parts of the country? I'm trying to think. I mean, there was less, you know, maybe in 2014, there was a pretty intense uh, war in Gaza, but I don't remember it being having the same political overtones, probably because it was after the the Mm -hmm. re-elect. Yeah, the re-elect was all... There wasn't a lot. Well, I guess there was uh, Benghazi was right around the reelect. But mostly it was a campaign waged about the size and role of government and the economy. Right. Right. And so you didn't have except for those crucial last couple months uh, after Benghazi, right before the election, you didn't really have an election that was fought on foreign policy issues. I was thinking about President Obama's statement that he put out on Israel and Gaza today and the measured the measured tone, the, the length of it, the measured tone, the sequencing of it and everything, obviously it all very, very carefully calibrated mm-hmm. to convey exactly what he wanted to convey. And I was just wondering if that, if there was anything to read there that is either an attempt to nudge President Biden um, one direction or the other, or even just to nudge his messaging um, around this issue in a way that's more, seen as more responsive to more communities. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I think he wanted to weigh in. I think he wrote this himself from everything we understand. I mm. think he, like, cares deeply about this, sort of wants to guide the conversation a little bit. He probably watches the discourse online being particularly toxic, and it bothers yeah. him, and he's trying to bring people together. I, I would imagine, if anything, he's trying to not piss off or nudge Biden publicly with this messaging. Anything like that he would do privately, I think. They probably ran it by the White House first before putting it out, would be my guess. Yeah, yeah. but I, I I took it, I I read it, and I thought it was very thoughtful. And what I took it to be was someone who views himself as a like a person who understands how to, to narrate some of the most difficult issues that we face as a country and trying mm-hmm. to just lay out an articulation of what a, um, a democratic position that is both supportive of Israel and concerned about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza would sound like as a reflection of what the Biden administration policy is, mm-hmm. right? Like kind of mm-hmm. an articulation of what a democratic vision for a pro-Israel but humanitarian um, American foreign policy would look like. Yeah, there's also like sort of two strains of his thinking that I noticed in that statement. One, which is like, he's never been a big fan of Bibi mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and been, yeah, or, or his policies, yeah. right? And also there was shades of his 2002 speech uh, against the Iraq war mm-hmm. and saying, you know, obviously in that speech, he talked about going after terrorists and going after Al Qaeda, but, and he's not opposed to all wars, but he's opposed to dumb wars. And you really got to think about before you go in, you send troops into battle and the consequences. And so the, I saw that a little bit in the, in that statement as the well. The other thing that I was just thinking reading that today is, um, going back to the decision-making in the Obama administration about Syria. And that was one of these things where I just felt like the punditry in the moment was so wrong. Like the year of punditry we had around decision making on Syria was just inane. It was just bad, bad takes left, right and center. Um, And I felt like he was actually in, in some important ways trying to do a very principled, very nonpartisan, very 30,000 feet thing, which was Congress should be involved in decisions about the U.S. military use of force. 
And everybody likes to throw proverbial bombs around here. But if we're going to throw real bombs, we should commit ourselves as a country to what we're going to do here. And Congress needs to be involved. This is not something that the president should be doing on his own. And everybody attacked him for all his Syria decisions. But I just felt like there was this moment where he was trying to say there's a way to deal with this structurally and in and, and principled terms that ought to guide us both for this conflict and in the long run. And he didn't go back to that idea. But I feel like that's the kind of nudge that he can give, which is look at it, look at it from, it's not just about being really good about talking to, about people and talking about human suffering, which he is very good at talking about that and talking about recognizing people's full humanity. It's also, I feel like he has the capability and I feel like as president, he had the capability to say there's a bigger responsibility that we have here, which is to who we are as a country and how our system of government works and how we speak on issues like this. So I'm still sort of waiting for some breakthrough like that mm -hmm. on Israel and Gaza um, that makes people feel like we can have a substantive fight that's about who we are that, and, and how that can be reflected in our national response. And I think, you know, interestingly, well, there's, when you look at Afghanistan and the Iraq wars, obviously the original sin of the Iraq war was invading in the first place, right? It never should have happened. But in terms of how both ended, both required some sort of political resolution to end them correctly or with yeah. finality. And in Afghanistan, obviously, that didn't work out. Similar challenges in Iraq led to an unstable government and a, a security situation that quickly deteriorated when our U.S. troops left. So I think that's part of what he's thinking here. It's like you can roll troops into Gaza, but unless there's a two-state solution or at least some sort of viable path to one, we're not going to get to a peaceful end state for anybody. Yeah. Wars are easy to start and hard to end. Mm -hmm. um, and usually they don't end with military might alone. So And to the, for the U.S. to have generals, you know, at, per, per today's news, advising the IDF um, on what not to do and how not to do it right now. Um, it's just it's a really this is a really precarious time. Yeah. In terms of what's I mean, this time next week, who knows where we're going to be in this war. Yeah. And certainly a, a fun time for Biden to be running for re-election. Yeah. Uh, what did you guys think of the Post story, uh, which was mainly about the Biden campaign potentially expanding its $25 million advertising campaign? Anyone have any thoughts on? So I could argue it both ways. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to pick a side? Good idea, <laughs> bad idea? <laughs> What's the bad idea argument? Bad idea would be like spending $25 million a year before anyone votes is burning cash. No one's paying attention. Um, similar efforts that were run by this super PAC in the story, Future Forward, haven't paid any dividends. Ultimately, the the winning message is probably going to be some sort of contrast with Trump. So don't spend your hard dollars, your you know, your the the most challenging to raise money that gets you uh, the best rates on advertisements down the stretch today. Now, I'm not, not necessarily believe that, but like that would be the argument against. Yeah, I don't. I guess, you know, they started running that sort of economics ad. Mm. And we talked about it at the time, wondering, so what is the value of doing that right now? That's not the kind of, like, is there something that they're seeing in focus groups or in polling that basically says long before we get to the, to the kind of, to the fall when there's a real contrast, there's a lot of work we have to do to kind of strengthen the general sense of what Joe Biden has done in the economy. And I just, I don't know anymore what the value, like, I just, I truly don't understand how to think about the value of television advertising now when, when media is so fractured, when a lot of the people that are most important to reach, like young people aren't necessarily going to see them. Like, how do we think about that? And I, I just think it's a campaign facing not like a, not just a political problem, but a cultural problem of we really don't know how to reach people who don't pay attention to the news. We know how to talk about the news in this sort of noisy maelstrom of conversation, and we know how to reach those people and engage those people. We know how to engage the people listening to get them to go knock on doors, and I think that's really important. But there are millions and millions of people who are not paying attention at all uh, who get the news in a really um, uh, attenuated way, and reaching those people, changing their minds, is getting harder and harder. I think they're part of what they're doing is testing yeah. Not just different ads and different messages, but different ways of breaking through to precisely the people that you're talking about right now. So I think the benefit to it, the other side with the well, I guess you you had the benefit to it. Oh no, you had you had why it was a bad idea. I had a bad idea, but yeah. I don't really believe that. I mean, I think that it, it sounds like they're just it's a relatively small ad buy early on to sharpen your message for your much bigger ad buy down the road. Yeah, and they're collecting all kinds of data that I don't think was even available to us in, in 2012 or even in 2016 to the Clinton campaign yeah. about like exactly how different demographic groups, different audiences are responding to different kinds of ads. So that I think it's like more of a testing phase. I think the bigger um, 
debate here that you see in that story is like should these ads how, how do you convince people or should the ad, should the intention of the should the purpose of the ads be to convince people that actually joe biden has um you know accomplished a lot that the economy is better than they think uh or is that just telling people what they don't actually feel and on that note i still think that it is really hard to convince people if they are grumpy about the economy that actually the statistics say differently and we're doing great and if i just repeat it enough then you'll believe it and i think you've got to set up the contrast i think the more effective way to do it is and i'd be interested in seeing how the audiences react to this but setting up a contrast with trump where you're saying all right if if you elect me again here's what i will do to help uh people who are struggling with costs and uh here's how i'll do it and by the way here's what trump said he'll do if he gets elected and mm -hmm. not just on the economy but on every other issue i mean it sort of feels like the answer is yes like they need to deal with sharpening their message it is going to come down to contrast with the republican nominee and they need to change the prevailing perception of Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that the prevailing um, perception of Joe Biden is um, impenetrable by advertising. Just because, I mean, what, what, space, what spaces are people going to to get their information now? It's very fractured. Um, TV is one of those spaces. Social media is itself actively fracturing as we speak. Mm -hmm. Um, the other forms of information that people get are sort of evolving constantly. Like, I don't know that in that environment that there's any better choice than advertising. You know, there's nothing else that emerges in its place and you can't create a different news environment. But because the news environment on the right has been so negative on the economy, particularly, you do need positive messaging about being constructive on the economy just to stand up against that. And why not do it through ads? Yeah, yeah I, I feel like I, I believe two opposite things. <laughs> One is that- um, It's a sign of intelligence. Yeah, yeah <laughs> sure. Um, uh, uh, thank you for saying that. But, the, <laughs> but I, I believe it is always a mistake if you're trying to convince people that their lived experience is in some way wrong and we should just take at face value all of this polling that says people don't fully be, believe in the economy right now. They have a lot of frustrations. They're very worried, they're very angry anxious, and that if what you're trying to do is tell them they're wrong, you're making a big mistake. And then I also think, on the other hand, we also see that, yes, there, there is sort of a kind of, um, there is partisan bias in pulling on the economy. Uh, when, when Trump is president, Republicans think it's doing better. When Democrats president, Democrats think it's doing better. That polarization is not equal. Uh, Republicans are better team players when they're answering questions mm -hmm. about the polling. And I do think there is, you know, we talked about we talk about this all the time, the kind of hand wringing and self flagellation we did as speechwriters during the Obama years to always make sure we said things are getting better, but they're not good enough. You always have to do the first part to make sure you weren't getting ahead of where people were on the economy. But if you do that for long enough, you don't get to the part where you tell people in a way they believe that things are actually getting better. And then you see someone like Trump. When he is in charge, things are fucking gangbusters. When things are not, they're in the toilet. It's pretty simple. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to put those two things together because there's a part of me that thinks, well, you know, if if we don't think we're winning, people watching aren't going to think we're winning either. And you know, we have to be our own boosters sometimes. And I, I just don't know how you square that circle. I think that in in part, talking about jobs, just making it like, what do people mean when they mean the economy? They mean lots of different things, and you can personalize it, or you can think in you know, sort of fake macro terms. You can talk about it in terms of what your cousin's personal circumstances are or whatever. But being able to talk about the one metric of jobs um, seems to me to be something where they can, create, they can create a narrative that ought to stick because it's so overwhelming in terms of the jobs numbers. And the contrast is there, and the raw value absolute numbers are there. Yeah. I also think you've got to show that you are fighting to improve people's lives and that you have a plan to do that. And we did that in 2011. Obama gave that job speech before Congress. And obviously, unemployment was the big problem there. Now it's uh, inflation. Unemployment's not an issue. Um, and he had this refrain, which was like, here's my jobs bill. Uh, Republicans, you've been for this policy, Democrats for this policy, send this to my desk, I'll sign it right away. And it was like a lot of, we, we intentionally made it a lot of action. And then he could take that out on the road and, and say, these Republicans are, are blocking progress. They're, they won't have a vote on these bills that are very popular and bipartisan. 
these are the kind of things that will create jobs. We've created so many so far. We're climbing back from the recession, but this is what we need to do, and this is why you need to send me back to the White House. And I do think that I, I'm sure he'll probably do that in the State of the Union, I would imagine, and then have the State of the Union be sort of a blueprint for the campaign this year. But I think that's the piece that's missing in the message right now. What you were describing about him saying, um, you know, it's 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 not that um, we can't get things done. I look at all these bipartisan things I've gotten done. It's just this MAGA wing of the Republican Party that they're the ones who have now shut down the legislature and then all these other. I just feel like that's it is. I, I just feel like it's almost inarguably the correct message. Yeah, right and now. it is inarguably his constant message like mm. it really is all he does and he gets no credit for it at all and i think the prescription is just to keep doing it yeah yeah i don't think it works on people who are discussing politics but i do think it works on people who don't listen very often and every once in a while they're going to hear some line from some speech and if that's it it's the best possible thing for it, them to hear and it's just hard because the more he has like all of these challenges that he hasn't ex hadn't expected, like all these foreign policy challenges and everything else, he doesn't get to do that message or deliver that message as much. Like when you have to be president and you have to go out to the to the podium and to the Rose Garden and talk, like you can't be as political. Mm -hmm. So I think some of this is Joe Biden gets back on the campaign trail, the ad campaign cranks up, more people are paying attention to Biden versus Trump, then he has the opportunity to deliver that message like he has been for the last four years. Yeah. But right now, I think not enough people are hearing it and he doesn't get to say it as often. I'm wondering also, and this is petty, so you will forgive me in advance, but I have always felt like there is um, <clears throat> a little bit of a, a like boy version of a beauty contest that happens in presidential general elections, which is the person who seems physically stronger tends to win, yeah. um, which is gross, stuff, yeah. but it's often the case. Um, and so I, I felt like that's why the, you know, define Joe Biden as old and doddering and all these things has been such a focus on the right is that they know, like with lizard brain, um, that that's really the most important thing they can do. But we have been in this circumstance for the last I mean, you could say for the last eight years, but or the last seven years, but really for the last few months in which um, Trump physically seems like he's falling apart and in which he makes a lot of false statements, not just false statements, but uh, like he gets things wrong and he slurs his words and he doesn't seem well and he seems unhealthy. And Obama he was seems... president three times last week, I think. In and speeches, and yeah. Jeb Bush was president yeah. <laughs> and Viktor Orban is the head of Turkey. Turkey yeah, the whole and thing. I mean, and all this stuff and just not being able to pronounce things and everything. None of that is is very important unless we're going to define the contest between these two men as an arm wrestling contest, um, as some sort of, you know, test of stamina or physical strength, which I feel like the right has really been staking out as their preferred ground. Yeah. And so I don't know what happens there with 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 Trump himself starting to. Well, that I think the left's doing a good job clipping those and sharing them like way better to, yeah. than we used to. Yeah. yeah. And I but I think the message behind when we share those has to be this is if it's this is a clown and an unserious person versus Joe Biden, who is a serious person who's trying very hard. I think mm -hmm. we win that fight. If it's um, you say Joe Biden's old, but Donald Trump's also old mm -hmm. or you say Joe Biden's flubbing words, but Donald Trump's also flubbing words, because then it is that contest of like who can seem less old. Yes. And I don't think that's a contest. No. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about Donald Trump. Um, he's not exactly in the best political position either. He's dominating the Republican primary, uh, but the rest of his polling is quite bad. He keeps getting bad legal news about the 91 criminal charges he's facing. Last week, two of his former lawyers and co-defendants, Sidney Powell and Kenneth Cheesebro, great name, uh, decided to plead guilty as part of the corrupt scheme to overturn the election in Georgia. Uh, Powell pleaded guilty to six misdemeanor counts, Cheesebro to a felony count of conspiracy to commit filing false documents, i.e. the fake electors. Um, both have agreed to testify in their co-defendants' trials, including Trump, who was asked about all of this on Monday. President, you said Sidney Powell, are you concerned that you won't be covered by attorney-client privilege? No, not at all. I'm, uh, we did nothing wrong. This is all Biden stuff. All of these indictments that you see. I was never indicted. Practically never heard the word. It wasn't a word that registered. <laughs> <laughs> there was no such thing as indictments before this. And uh, by the way, I wasn't indicted. Prove I was. <laughs> it's really... Fake news. Hoaxy, hoaxy. That's all Biden was indicted. I'm not indicted. He was indicted. <laughs> no puppet, no puppet. But yeah, that's where we're, that's where we're at right now. <laughs> um, all right, so I've seen some people say uh, that Powell and Cheese Bros uh, pleas are very bad for Trump. 
I've heard others say we don't yet know if their testimony will be all that damning. Um, what do you, what do you think, Rachel? Uh, what what was their involvement in like could what they know be potentially damning for Trump? You know, it remains to be seen in terms of what kind of witnesses they're going to be, because it's not only what you know and what prosecutors know you know, and they can compel you to testify to because you have done it, you've agreed to testify in exchange for lenience for yourself. It's not just that. It's also kind of how the trial's going Mm. in terms of how a witness lands. I actually think that the most important thing about Powell and Cheeseboro pleading is that it means there's not going to be a trial in Fulton County in October. Mm. And the reason that's important is because Fonnie Willis kept saying, I want to put them all in the same courtroom all at once. It's a it's a it's a conspiracy. It's a RICO conspiracy. I'm happy to try them all at once. Now, I just wrote a book about the 1944 Great Sedition Trial where they put 29 defendants in the same courtroom. And it was so stressful. Not only did it end in a mistrial, it ended in a mistrial because the judge died. Wow. It was so That's bad. amazing. So I don't want vignette. 19 defendants in the same room. But the fact that Fonnie Willis wanted it and has argued for it tells you something about her case. And she did not want Cheeseboro and Powell to go first because that would mean previewing her case for the rest of the defendants. Mm. And them both pleading out means that there's not going to be some dry run where the defense counsels for all these defendants get to see what it is she's got. And that's better for her prosecution, um, for her prosecution strategy, I think. That's just there's that there isn't a preliminary case. I also think that, I saw someone say that, for her to offer a deal to both of them that doesn't involve any jail time, mm-hmm. You would think that they have some kind of valuable testimony, maybe not about Trump, but at least about, I mean, Cheeseboro was dealing not directly with Trump, but with Rudy and a couple others. So it seems like they must have something valuable if she didn't give them any. But, but again, how does, what does the jury think of them as witnesses? Yeah, you know, that's What true. does the jury think of the, that part, the seriousness of that part of the allegation? I just feel like it, it just, I don't think there's anything that we can say. I don't think there's any witness in any of these cases where we can say, oh, that person's going to testify. That means X is going to happen mm. in the case. Yeah. I just don't, I just, I just feel like when I've looked at big landmark cases of different kinds, it's never, it's never that simple. Surely having your co-defendants plead guilty in exchange for a promise to testify against you is not good news. Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. don't know That's good that we know it's best how neutral, bad it yeah. is. Yeah. It's either bad or neutral, probably. <laughs> exactly. um, there was also a New York Times story and a 60 Minutes Australia piece about the Australian billionaire Mar-a-Lago member who Trump allegedly spilled secrets to about America's nuclear submarines. Uh, apparently, they got their hands on some new recordings of Anthony Pratt talking about his conversations with Trump. Uh, let's listen. Yeah, and Trump said... Uh... You know, that Ukraine phone call, that was nothing compared to what I usually do. <laughs> he knows exactly what to say and what not to say so that he avoids jail, but gets so close to it that it looks to everyone like he's breaking the law. All of these guys are like the mafia, Trump, Rupert, Rudy. You want to be a customer, not a competitor. <laughs> Rudy is someone that I hope will be useful one day. Plus, I just think he's cool. It's not all just sort of like, seat of the pants shit. I think that him and Rudy are like that and they're plotting all this out. Melania, who was sitting next to him at dinner, he said, I asked Melania to walk around the pool in a bikini so all the other guys could get a look at what they were missing. Then Melania said back to him, I'll do that when you walk around with me in your bikini. I like the, oh. like the music there. Yeah. yeah the, um, <laughs> That guy, that guy offered Rudy Giuliani a million dollars to come to his birthday party. Why does he think Rudy Giuliani's cool? That was the <laughs> that was the most troubling thing that guy has said. Yeah, I don't know that a Mar-a-Lago Austra- so member is like a, the best judge of uh, <laughs> class, taste, character. <laughs> I didn't realize they let people with that accent make a billion dollars. <laughs> That's cool. Can I, so, so the mafia thing that he said, he says the thing, they're all like the mafia. You want to be a customer, not a competitor. Mm-hmm. Is that like a mob movie thing I that know. I don't know? I, I've never heard that. I, that I thought that was an, a great line right there, but I was like, maybe, I don't know. I was maybe like, that's is this a... a mantra that people who are <laughs> operating adjacent to the mafia tell themselves every morning? Customer, not competitor. Customer, not competitor. <laughs> yeah. like, I, I've never maybe. heard that before. The Pre- subtext that they'll kill you, I guess. Yes. Pretty nice kangaroo. Be ashamed if something were to happen to it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> 
<laughs> like the, the the headline news out of this report was that Trump gave this guy accidentally or wittingly, I guess, a bunch of nuclear sub secrets about the number of warheads, et cetera. It is interesting though that this comes out in the middle of this ongoing impeachment effort that's trying to like tell a story about the Biden crime family, and you have this Australian billionaire being like, "Yeah, I bought into Mar-a-Lago. I paid a Rudy a million dollars coming to my birthday party. I like grifted and all these. I rented all the rooms for election night, right? Like this is a pay-to-play scheme that was this entire Trump administration." all laid out in this fun yeah. little accent. And what he got for it was, well, let me tell you about how many nuclear submarines we have, and let me tell you about uh, that Ukraine call? Come on, I did worse than that. And it's not even like it's an let's, it's an exchange for like, you, you pay this money and I'll give you these secrets. It's more like you pay this money and I'll brag to you no, he, about how great it is to be president. Well, Trump also like did events with him, toured his factory, would like praise him at events and stuff. So it was just oh, sort of yeah. like a back padding competition. Yeah. It's really small. You just make sure that so it's small. This guy, has, it has, he, this guy has like tens of billions of dollars. He's very, very, very wealthy. And you just think like, okay, if I ever became a person who had 34 or 24 billion dollars, whatever he had, would I be like, if I go to Mar-a-Lago on that day, is he going to be there that day? And can I hear the swimsuit thing? Can I, I want you to say the swimsuit thing in front of me. And then I'm going to tell my friends. And, yeah. I mean, it's just like. That's bored rich people. Thing. Bored. That's what rich. And, and one of them was president with access to the nuclear. Right. It's also, it's also, it's also how small Trump is. I mean, like yeah, right. he walks in, he, he treats being the president like he won a silver at Nagano and he walks into the bar and he goes, this Oh, this whole thing, it was cold and windy. I'll tell you the story. It's like he like <laughs> he like he wants he just so desperately wanders around these weddings. He just wants to talk to people. The um the submarine thing, which I didn't totally grok at first. So there's obviously we don't talk about submarines, right? Mm. So they're nuclear powered nuclear armed submarines talking about their stealth capabilities, talking about their weapons. But then once he told the cardboard magnate billionaire guy that guy told 45 other people <laughs> including journalists in, including a half dozen journalists and multiple former heads of state and other foreign government officials so what ha- i mean so what happens to the classified documents case i mean this this stuff isn't implicated directly in the classified right. documents case he is listed as a potential witness in that case, but the the promulgation of that kind of information to all those people, like, wow, what do we do about that? Doesn't it, it, well, it makes it, you think that the evidence in the case is has got to be really strong if this stuff wasn't implicated. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also, and also, just that, hey, no matter what we confiscate, no matter what we do, the information inside of Donald Trump's head, which he is not protecting. Is is at risk of being released if we don't do something to punish him. That like it's the, all for sale. And the only way, the only way to, the only way to actually make sure that he hasn't shared this information is by sending him to jail, right? Like the only way to, the only way to, the only way to, or just if you are sure wor- he doesn't get to be president again. Well, that that's <laughs> sure for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but that a, we can't one. do that in the courtroom because if we don't, if we don't stop that. We no should, jail um, and should men in black on one of those. Yeah, and all, like, he'll thing. have all the secrets. He'll be able to do whatever he wants. He's got nothing to lose. Nothing to lose in the second term. I don't know. I mean, I don't think there is a solution to it, right? I mean, if he goes to jail, he's not going to go to jail forever. He'll then get out. Yeah. Also, he can make phone calls from jail. Like, there's, there's no the the on, the problem that we are in right now as a country is that the only solution to our problems is to go back in time and not put somebody that criminal in that big a job. Mm. And unless you can undo time that, you, oh. you, I mean, <laughs> once you've done that, once you've done somebody who is implicated in this much alleged criminal behavior and they've had that kind of a job, there just isn't an easy way out that doesn't hurt the country. What if someone did that fucked up, accidentally left a gold bar in Bob Menendez's car? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Good point. We saw that. We saw your segment on 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 Menendez and your show tonight, what did you and think? we were all yelling at the TV. We were like, "Yeah, what's wrong with you, Democrats?" It's We've been say- crazy like, to me. I don't know where. Like, why doesn't Chuck Schumer get him off the committee? They took him <laughs> when you took him out of the chairmanship of mm-hmm. the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Why'd you do that? Because of his federal felony indictments? Right. Okay. And so then when the superseding indictment came out and it turned out he, what he was accused of by the U.S. Justice Department is being a foreign agent, did it occur to you at that point that maybe it was time for another step? How is it that he is still on the committee? 
I think it's wild. And it was just like a, a, a an arrangement of convenience that he didn't receive the last classified briefing on what's going on with the war. It wasn't some sort of formal thing where they were like, no, Bob Menendez, no more classified briefings to you. It was just like, oh, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't do that one. They just sidestepped that as an issue. Where the, the, the country that was paying him off and as far as I can tell, running him as a spy is directly <laughs> implicated in what's happening currently. The Egyptians are one of the other borders of Gaza. He's and like, this, I'll skip this briefing. This, this is a problem. A lot of problems are hard, right? What do you do with the classified information in Donald Trump's head? Like, I, I really don't, I don't yeah. know that there's an answer to that. This is not a hard one. If the Republicans want to take Bob Menendez off the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, here's what they do. Bob, you're no longer on the Foreign Relations Committee. Instead, this other person is. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. That's all they have to do. It's completely within their power. Yes, the Republicans could like rise up and try to stop them from installing somebody new, but they're not going to because they don't want to fight over Bob Menendez because they're not willing to say that Menendez should resign. Right. That's why I don't understand. I, I don't quite understand. We were talking about why yeah. the Democrats wouldn't do it. And I don't like, are they worried that Bob Menendez will like change parties and start caucusing with the Republicans? And like, I don't know. Uh, Even maybe, that wouldn't maybe? cost them the majority. I guess it would shave it down one more, but it's still like. But if, the, if he's holding national security hostage for right. that kind of a threat we ought to know about that that's they sh- they can't just handle that by like back oh, but that's but, hold the thing. but it but that's the fucking move you go full trump trump pardons you you go full trump uh, and what else are you supposed to do you go full fucking trump you go full you just, trump you do blagojevich you, you do blagojevich oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Andrew, right you know, in that right in blagojevich looked pretty smart when he was walking out of that jail <laughs> <laughs> oh, pretty early. He smart played, was the word? Played, yeah, yeah. Know, played those guys. That day, that day he was a smart guy. Well, let's not Walk- give Bob Menendez any <laughs> ideas yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, nobody, Bob, chill out. He's, I don't think he's a listener. Um, <laughs> but also Democrats in the Senate leak to us. Like, to, yeah, to tell, to like explain yourselves. Yeah, I leak know. to Rachel. Well, leak, asked, to, leak to me. Call me. I asked Fetterman this when because he's been really forward leaning on this yeah. and I was like what's with all your colleagues He's like I don't speak for them I can't speak for them but who does <laughs> right. I mean this is I'm so, like this is just unconscionable I know like it's one yes you can talk about the Republicans and everything's wrong with them that's fine but at the end of the day the the thing you have to answer to to whomever you answer is for your own actions and in this case the action of leaving him on the foreign relations committee when you have the power to remove him is it, it's it's bonkers. beyond the no it's bonkers. beyond. Okay, uh, before we get to break, uh, just two quick housekeeping notes. Pod Save America will be live in Louisville, Kentucky, in Cleveland, Ohio, on October 28th and 29th. We will be joined by journalist Perry Bacon, Kentucky Congressman Morgan McGarvey, co-host Alyssa Mastromonaco, abortion rights advocate Kelly Copeland, Congresswoman Amelia Sykes, and more. Uh, head to crooked.com slash events to get your tickets now and see where else we're headed this year. Also, Quick shout out to our friends of the pod subscription community who are probably listening right now on our ad free feed. I uh, want to let you guys know that I'm stopping by the Friends of the Pod Discord on Thursday, October 26th for a round of Ask Me Almost Anything, where I'll be chatting with subscribers and answering your burning questions. If you haven't subscribed to Friends of the Pod yet, now's the time. Head to crooked.com slash friends to sign up. When we come back, we'll talk to Rachel Moore about her new book, Prequel An American Fight Against Fascism. Pod Save America is brought to you by Tommy John. There are exactly two kinds of gifts in the world. Ooze and O's. Oh, I get it. Want guaranteed ooze? Be bold and give the gift of Tommy John underwear. When you give Tommy John, your loved ones are that much more comfortable so they can do everything better. This softness season, why not give the gift of comfort to everyone on your list, including yourself, with new Tommy John underwear, loungewear, and pajamas. With over 20 million pairs sold and thousands of five-star reviews, giving Tommy John is a holiday tradition. 97% of women and men love getting the gift of Tommy John. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They got fanatics. One fanatic raves. Fantastic. Christmas gift that went so right. She loves the pajamas. Nice work. Great. Congrats. And everything covered by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guaranteed. We love Tommy John. Uh, Wear all their stuff. Got great pajamas. Very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Good loungewear. Prepare in advance. Buy some things in advance so that when Christmas comes around, you're not scrambling. Get some Tommy John. It's great advice, Tommy. Now. Great advice. Shop TommyJohn.com slash Crooked right now for the holidays and get 20% off your first order. Save 20% for a limited time at TommyJohn.com slash Crooked. TommyJohn.com slash Crooked. See site for details. Pod Save America is brought to you by Real Paper. Trees are a renewable resource, but not an unlimited resource. That's why Real Paper uses bamboo to make their sustainable toilet paper. Bamboo grows incredibly fast, and it can be cut and harvested over and over again. When you use Real 
You're not sacrificing to help the earth. You're upgrading. Real is partnered with One Tree Planted. So with every box of real that you buy, they fund reforestation efforts across the country. So unlike the other TP that cuts down trees, Real is helping to actively plant them. Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping and 100% recyclable plastic-free packaging. If you head to realpaper.com slash cricket and sign up for a subscription using promo code cricket at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash cricket or enter promo code cricket to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. Let's make a change for good this year and switch to Real Paper. Real is paper for the planet. All right, I want to talk about your new book called Prequel, uh, which is based off your fantastic award-winning podcast, Ultra. Uh, Both tell the story of a homegrown fascist plot to overthrow American democracy just before we entered World War II, a conspiracy that reached the highest levels of the U.S. government. For people who haven't listened to the podcast or read the book, um, could you talk about how serious the threat was? Yes, thank you. Um, First of all, thanks for asking me about it. Um, So we had, at the same time that... um, Germany went to Hitler and Italy went to Mussolini and Spain went to Franco and the French fascists overran parliament in 1934 and ousted the democratically elected government and the British had the British Union of Fascists. When this was rising everywhere in the world, we had our own problem. And we think of Americans' confrontation with the Nazis as having been the military confrontation when we were good guys and they were bad guys and we went over there and beat them. But here in the United States, the, it wasn't just that people didn't want to go fight World War II by very large numbers. In 1940, it was 83% of the public didn't want mm. us to fight. Um, it was that there was a big fascist movement here. Um, virulently anti-Semitic, associated with right-wing paramilitary groups, um, and associated with the Nazi government in Berlin, to the point where there was a Nazi agent, he was the senior Nazi propaganda agent in the United States, and he was running a huge multi-million dollar propaganda campaign in the United States, like at the behest of the German Foreign Office, and he had two dozen senators and members of Congress working for him, running all this mail out of their offices so that the post office, uh, the postage would be paid by the American taxpayer. Franking privilege. The franking privilege. <laughs> I'm trying to make the franking privilege hot. <laughs> yeah, right. so, no, so it was. I. I um, it's been. It's. I. It's always been seen as a kind of obscure chapter in American history. I think for obvious reasons because we had World War II and we won and we. That was. That's a very comfortable. That's a very comfortable tale to tell. It's more uncomfortable to think about us Americans having been on that side. But it was more well-connected and more radical um, and more successful than I think previously understood. And that's what I'm trying to just help us learn that, not because it's a, I don't think there's any analogy between Nazism then and and our ultra-right today, obviously. Only Nazis are Nazis. (laughs) Only Hitler is Hitler. But there is an analogy, I think, that we can learn from in terms of Americans who fought that surprisingly effective, surprisingly well-connected movement and beat them and shut it down. You draw a lot of parallels, obviously, in the book. They're sort of unsaid parallels between uh, then and now. I wonder, like, what is different about the threat that we face today? What feels different? Not just in, like, the not actual Nazis, but just in the, in the general sort of larger context, political, social context. I think that there's basically, like, four things that you look for for a democracy that's at risk of becoming an authoritarian state. And lots of experts smarter than me have different lists. For me, it's four. Mm. One is that you see um, not just targeting of minorities, but scapegoating of minorities. So you get Baroque evil conspiracy theories about how they're secretly to blame for all of our problems. Because then you've got a common enemy that you need a strong man to unite the country against. Then you've got oh, we can't have democracy because those evil people would participate in it. Mm -hmm. Democracy is weak and makes us prey to these bad people. Mm. So you got that. You've got don't trust information. Don't trust um, journalists, science experts. Only believe the dear leader. Go with your gut. Trust your prejudices. Um, And we've got um, the, the intrusion of violence into the political space so that the political space becomes a place that normal people kind of can't play. If you want to be a poll worker, but it means you're going to end up having death threats and people storming your house, then normal people aren't going to be poll workers. So you watch for that. But the, the last thing is, is actually the, the most boring and most important, which is technically is your democracy functioning. In order to hold on to your democracy, you not only need to defend it, but you need to believe in it, and you need to use it to solve the problem of rising authoritarianism. Mm. And so people need to believe that the 
election process and that the democratic process writ large is what we use to solve our problems. And the the good news in this book, in, in prequel, is that all these members of Congress who are all hooked up with this Nazi agent, almost to a one, they all got voted out. When the American public, through good journalism and good activism and the Justice Department exposing them, told the American people what was going on, even people who are household names, who'd been in Congress for 25 years, who were seen as presidential timber, the president's best friend, all this stuff, all voted out because the American people did not like that idea. The thing that's different now that worries me is that election denialism and don't believe in elections and your vote doesn't matter. Mm. I mean, Trump saying today, don't worry about yeah. voting. We've got all the votes we need. Um, just monitor voting. Just monitor voting. Monitor the vote count and monitor <laughs> voting. That stuff is like they just they didn't get far enough with it in the 30s and 40s. They were trying to, but they didn't get that. And they're much further along with that messaging. And that's not just bad for people who believe it on its face because they like that side of politics. It's bad for Americans who might try to fix this because all of us need to believe that voting out people who are close to these sorts of plots and movements is the solution to these plots and movements. When you think about that scenario, how it played out in the past, and you think about today with, you know, Elon Musk saying, don't listen to these lying journalists, listen to these blue checks that gave me money. We think about the withering of local news, uh, gerrymandering of districts that mm -hmm. would make it incredibly hard to vote out some of the individuals you're talking about. Do you worry more that, you know, repeating that kind of, uh, you know, systems and good guys and women winning wouldn't maybe not happen? Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's the part of it that I'm so worried about. I mean, to the extent that you've got people who have an, are part of an anti-democratic project who are telling you, don't believe election results, don't think that the vote is the way we're going to fix these problems, don't think that democracy is the way our country should run, that's bad. But it's really bad if it's true. Mm. It's really bad if your vote doesn't actually count mm -hmm. because either the elections are being stolen somewhere or because you're gerrymandered out of essentially ever being able to have a legitimate say in, in, in what governance is that applies to you. And so the weakening of the just the technical aspects of democracy takes away the best weapon that we have to, to fix this problem. Um, and so it's just it's it's not abstract. It's urgent. Are there strengths that we have or lessons from having gone through this in the 30s that we now draw on that put us at an advantage as opposed to, I mean, what you just described is what's the difference between now and the 1930s? Oh, here are four ways in which things were a little bit worse. But like, what are the ways in which right now you look at the way Americans are responding or the way our country is reacting to a far right threat that you say speaks to having learned from this? Very good question. And nobody asks me that question in that way. Um, talking about this, so I'm really still happy. Got it. You still got it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. We didn't get a it. fucking very good question. <laughs> what the fuck's happening? I'm out of here. It's so hot in the studio. <laughs> so <laughs> fucking hot. I can't even think, let alone form another. I'm question. sorry. There was a good question that was asked. Sorry. Sorry. Some, sorry. Somebody had asked a question. What? I would say. I would. I would say two <laughs> things. One is um, the, the Justice Department knows not to put 29 people on trial in the same courtroom. Like that's good. Right. Um, th there's two big sedition trials that I, I write about in the book. One in 1940. Um, and in that case, the FBI really thought this Christian Front militia was seven days away from a plot that was supposed to start with the murder of 12 congressmen. And they had lots of National Guardsmen and NYPD and lots of bombs and U.S. military machine guns. And it was a serious thing. Um, and when those guys were put on trial, the trial did not succeed in convicting any of them and they were all let go. And then in 1944, we've got the even bigger sedition trial. There's 29 of them. It was 17 defendants in 1940. It's 29 in 1944. That trial also, no successful convictions. And those guys melted into the sauce, um, which is a very dangerous and bad thing. And I feel like the Justice Department has learned from some of those things. The, the other thing that I don't know whether or not they've learned, but I really hope they have, is that part of what went wrong with the effort to deal with this through the criminal justice system in the 30s and 40s is that <laughs> implicated senators like Burton Wheeler, a Democrat from Montana, pressured the attorney general to fire the prosecutor who was leading the investigation and leading the prosecution. And the attorney general caved and did so. Um, that's really bad. President Truman then in 1946 
caved and fired another Justice Department official who was trying to expose this because among the people who were going to get exposed were his best friends from the Senate. So that the political pressure on the Justice Department, I hope, is something that has a red flag on it. I think people like Jeff Berman from the Justice Department era, from the Trump era Justice Department raising a red flag about those things um, and having gone through that is, 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 is a little bit of hope there. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's one example of something that I think we're doing better. Do you think that uh, the pro-democracy forces in this country are doing a good enough job making the case about why democracy is a better system for most people in this country, like people, our audience, your audience, people who pay close attention to politics, like we get all the arguments about democracy, we're passionate about it. For most people in the country who don't pay close attention to politics, who barely consume the news, who are worried about more things close to home, um, I wonder if like we're making a good enough argument. It's hard because you don't want to scaremonger, you know, I mean, you don't right. want to, and I, I mean, the, the thing that I try to convey is like, we'll really miss this when it's gone. <laughs> oh <laughs> that, no. <laughs> I mean, that's when you say when you get dumped. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most democracies don't last and most countries that have lost democracy never get it back. And we are a standout example of a country that has held on to a robust democracy for a long time, but there's no reason to think that it is inevitable that we will. And to create that sense of, uh, um, I think, honest precarity around us being a democratic system. Just listen to what Trump says about voting. Listen to what Trump says about elections. Why is he describing the election that he won in 2016 as stolen? Why is he describing the next election in which he's not yet a competitor as already stolen? He's doing this because he wants people to believe that elections are fake, and so therefore we shouldn't bother having them. It's just, it's, and then it's a, it's a, it's a, a challenge of imagination. Can you imagine? what a country is like that looks like this, except has a president who never leaves office. Right. I mean, yeah. last week, while President Biden was traveling to Israel and lowering prescription drug prices and, you know, putting the brakes on uh, people having to stay pay back their student loans, Vladimir Putin, in his 24th year of office, went to China to go to a summit hosted by President Xi, who's president for life, so he could meet with Viktor Orban, who's in his 14th year in office. So they could talk about how they want a new multipolar world where the United States doesn't lead the way anymore. Right. Like that's that's the other way that this goes. And I think that we have to the next step is to draw a line from that sort of system of government to the consequences it has for people in those countries yes. and other countries. Because yes. also, like, look what Vladimir Putin's doing with his country right now. Yeah. Look at how many people he's sending to their deaths and how many people he's responsible for slaughtering, right? Yeah. Um, because that's kind of, that's life in an authoritarian government. Yeah. And by the way, life in a democracy can be wonderful. <laughs> and, you know. And also f frustrating and, and, and people can struggle and it's infuriating at times, but it's also, you know. It's, I mean, what does it mean to be in political opposition in the United States? Frustration and um, agonized pa podcast conversations <laughs> and occasionally having, um, you know, bad things happen in the legislature in which you are torn between whether to make fun or be seriously concerned about the other people who can't get it together. I mean, that's what political opposition means in this country. But if you are Alexei Navalny in Russia, your lawyers just got arrested. Mm. You're in a penal colony and your lawyers just got arrested for the crime of representing you while you are trying to be an opposition politician. And that's, I just, um, I, I just feel like the, the, the more we learn about what else our situation could be and what one side of our politics is driving us toward, um, I, think, I think the argument makes itself, but your mileage may vary. Yeah. Well, Rachel, before we let you go, I'm going to open my laptop. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how you know we're getting serious. <laughs> this is, uh, I'm getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, in your new book, prequel. There we go. Woo! Thank you very much. You track you track the fight. I didn't. That was <laughs> an audio, that audio awesome. medium here. Uh, you track the fight of those inside and outside the government to repel a takeover by right wing extremists who are enamored with fascism, anti Semitic conspiracy theories, and an all out assault on the left. I don't think it would have come as a surprise to you that there are parallels to what we see playing out in the far right today. Not that you draw an equivalence, but nevertheless, 
So we're going to read an actual quote. And the question is, is this a quote recounted in your book? Or is it from the unwritten book called Our Present? <laughs> is this fascism original formula? Or is this fascism the new batch, which is a reference to a film called Gremlins 2 that you have not seen? <laughs> I, be I bet. You are correct. <laughs> question one, here is the quote. Uh, we all know for whom we're voting if we vote for blank. For the communists, the socialists, for the Mexican lovers. Was this about President Franklin Delano Roosevelt or President Joseph Robinette Biden? I know that it was about Roosevelt. Was it also said about Biden? It has been, but this was about Roosevelt. That you correct. The whom uh, gave it away. The whom. No yeah. one's used <laughs> it. No one's used whom. No one's used uh, it. That was Father Charles Coughlin. And I note he also included Russian lovers in his list, which had given it away, because today the right wouldn't speak the same way about Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. As, as a far-right figure warned that a certain group wanted to corrupt youth through subversive teaching, destroy family life, dominate people through their vices, and undermine the respect for religion. Was this about gays and theys in the 2020s or Jews and Jews in the 1930s? It was about Jews and Jews in the 1930s. And yeah. do you know who it was? Do you remember who it was? Is it Pelly? This was Pelly. Yeah. Who started a right-wing anti-Semitic paramilitary group. Uh, question three. A Scott candidate... Pelly did that? <laughs> it was Scott Pelly. Yeah, wow. Which it Pelly was, was it? Scott <laughs> Pelly. You know, in Australia, the 60 Minutes clock goes the other way. <laughs> A candidate warned that the sitting president had joined with, quote, a band of his closest thugs, misfits, and Marxists to destroy American democracy, and we must keep foreign, Christian-hating communists, Marxists, and socialists out of America. Was that a candidate in the 30s or a candidate in the unfolding present? Yes. Yes, it was. It was Trump in June of this year. I was going to say, it sounded yeah. like a Trump quote. Yeah. Next quote. Uh, I have an idea this is still a Christian country, but there is an objection to use the word Christian. They want to take out of take it out of my mouth, the word Christ and Christian, and they can't do it. Is that about a manufactured war on Christians or a manufactured war on Christmas? <laughs> yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. But is that is that Smith or is that? It's Mosley. Oh, that's General George Van Horn Mosley. Mm -hmm. He's one of my favorite bad guys in the book. Uh, why? Because... So he wanted a lot of the different fascist groups um, wanted George Van Horn Mosley to be the Fuhrer. Uh, he had been deputy chief of staff of the U.S. Army. He thought that and campaigned on the idea that all Jews in America should be forcibly sterilized. Like he was really wow. he was that guy. Um, and the army came to him after he testified in Congress in 1938, I think it was. And they said, General Mosley, we understand you are auditioning for the role of American Fuhrer. <laughs> for uh, once you and your friends overthrow democracy and install the type of Hitlerite government that you're looking for here, you have rights as an American to advocate anything you want. You have, you have free speech. However, we are the U.S. Army, and this is awkward for us. And so if you want to keep doing that, we're going to stop paying your pension. So it's your choice. You can keep trying to be the American Fuhrer, or you can keep your pension. And he was like... I think I want the pension. Wow. <laughs> what a story. Yeah, it was so, what, a, what a brain. Anyway. Uh, you could Trump that choice? I was going to give him, yeah, pay him a little more. <laughs> Did, what, wasn't there some offer? Sam yeah, SBF, yeah, yeah, to do it. Yeah, yeah. Michael, Michael Lewis says SBF was going to pay him a bunch five, of money. Five billion yeah. dollars or yeah. something? Yeah. Steal it twice the price. Uh, last one. I would build a wall about the United States so high and so secure. I say we should stop and stop now the refugees who are seeping into this country by the thousands to take the jobs which rightly belong to the native and natural born citizens of the United States. Here's a hint. Uh, their, per their motto was about putting America first. The person who said this was divorced twice and had children with three different women. <laughs> Senator Robert Rice Reynolds that of is North Carolina. That is oh. correct. Yes. In 1941. Yeah, he was a monster. Yeah. But yeah, he wanted to, his big idea was to build a wall to keep out Jewish refugees because they were going to take all our jobs and corrupt our Christianity. Oof. Yeah. So we've been up against worse. Right. I mean, having an ultra right movement ascendant in this country that is um, very anti-Semitic, that is anti-democratic at its core, that is in love with foreign dictators, <laughs> yeah. that um, that is connected to very popular people including the most powerful industrialist in the country, Henry Ford, and Father Coughlin, who was the most powerful media figure, maybe in American history. People like Charles Lindbergh, who was a consensus national hero. I mean, all these people are pull pulling in that direction while Hitler is steamrolling Europe. And Americans whose names we have forgotten and who are not famous stood up against them and prosecuted them and infiltrated them and did amazing exposés of them and ran against them and ousted them from office. And they gave us a gift. 
Um, well, that and, is yeah. that is a very hopeful note to end on. Yes. Thank you so much, Rachel, you for uh, joining the pod again. The Thank book you. is Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism. It is fantastic. Everyone go buy it. Great cover art. Uh, it's great cover art. Thank you And also much. go listen to Ultra also. It's just a fantastic podcast. Um, thanks for stopping by. Next time, let's not make it four years okay. until you come by again. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.